Welcome to Homelands. Uh, if you're a visitor, we trust you'll feel very much at home among us. And we welcome those who are watching online or by DVD. Uh, we haven't forgotten you because you're important to us as well. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know God's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory be to him forever. Amen. We're going to sing two worship songs to begin our service this morning. The first one is As We Are Gathered. And then we sing, Be still for the presence of the Lord. Please be seated. Now we come to prayer, and after I've prayed, if you'd like to join me in saying the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. 
Father, we would be still in your presence and realise that you are moving in this place, that you are Lord, that you are holy, and we bow before your throne and acknowledge who you are, almighty, majestic, powerful, all-knowing. You are a wonderful God and we worship you. We thank you for your love that you have poured down upon us, the love that we see in our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Saviour. Thank you that you gave him up for us all, that we might be redeemed, that we might be made holy, that we might be made new. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your life, your perfect life here on earth, for your death on the cross, your mighty resurrection, and the fact that one day you are coming again in great power and glory. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here. May we truly worship in spirit and in truth. Open up your word to us that we may hear and understand and respond. And today as we begin a new series on the life of Paul, we thank you for Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, the Apostle to us. We thank you for the grace which changed him from the persecutor to the servant of the faith. Help us also so to love you and so to surrender to you that we too may find the grace that makes all things new. Father, we bring this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And now Liz Huxley is going to bring our reading for this morning. A reading is from Acts chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. Saul was uttering threats with every breath. He was eager to destroy the Lord's followers, so he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was nearing Damascus on this mission, a brilliant light from heaven suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men with Saul stood speechless with surprise, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. As Saul picked himself up off the ground, he found that he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days, and all that time he went without food and water. 
Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you arrive, ask for Saul of Tarsus. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and we hear that he is authorised by the leading priests to arrest every believer in Damascus. But the Lord said, Go and do what I say, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for me. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you may get your sight back and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptised. Afterward, he ate some food and was strengthened. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who persecuted Jesus' followers with such devastation in Jerusalem, they asked? And we understand that he came here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, the Jewish leaders decided to kill him, but Saul was told about their plot and that they were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. So during the night, some of the other believers let him down in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They thought he was only pretending to be a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus. Barnabas also told them what the Lord had said to Saul and how he boldly preached in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Then the apostles accepted Saul and after that he was constantly with them in Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they plotted to murder him. When the believers heard about it, however, they took him to Caesarea and sent him on to his hometown in Tarsus. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria, and it grew in strength and numbers. The believers were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. We're going to sing I Am a New Creation. We'll sing it through twice.
Please sit down. Well, out of the inspiring words of Paul to the church in Ephesians chapter 2, says that we have been raised with him to the heavenly places, that we are lifted up, and we're going to listen to what is a secular song, but the words are so appropriate. You raised me up.
now Dory is going to lead us in prayer. On the night of the 14th, 15th of April, 2014, 276 girls, aged 16 to 18, most of them Christians, were kidnapped from their school in Nigeria by the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram, which stands for No Western Education. Over 50 of the girls escaped immediately by jumping from the trucks on which they were being transported. Others were rescued by the Nigerian armed forces on various occasions, but 112 girls are still unaccounted for. They're now young women, probably married to Muslim husbands, probably mothers. These young women and their parents will take first place in our prayers this morning. Father, at the start of our service, we heard Paul's words that it's impossible for us to understand your decisions and your ways. We certainly feel that. And it comforts us to know that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And we are so thankful that Jesus is at your right hand, interceding for us. We join today with our brothers and sisters in Nigeria as they gather to remember the kidnapping 10 years ago, and especially the 112 young women who never returned. There will doubtless be tears and we thank you that one day you will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Bring them comfort from their church family. And we pray that you will help those young women to know that you will never leave them nor forsake them, however hard that may be. There are so many situations to pray for, Father. We hardly know where to start. Each day brings some new turn of events or some tragedy. An ordinary shopping day in Australia, devastated by a killing spree. Ukraine, overshadowed by Gaza. Gaza, now overshadowed by Iran's attack on Israel. We pray for continued support for Ukraine, for a just peace in Gaza, and a steady supply of aid. And we pray for wisdom for world leaders even today as they watch the Israel-Iran situation and are in touch with each other and look to bring restraint. There are elections this year at international, national and local levels and we pray that you would bring into office more people of integrity with a servant heart. We pray for all the aid agencies worldwide as they look to meet ever-growing needs. Give wisdom as they prioritize where to deploy their resources and renew them in strength daily as they serve people who are hungry and helpless. And then, Father, we pray for our church family here at Homelands. Only you know the deepest needs of each one of us. We thank you that you are our rock and our refuge. Help us to grow in faith hope and love, so that the light of the gospel shines from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Doreen. We're going to sing a, an old hymn, a lovely hymn, One Day When Heaven Was Filled With His Praises. And the, the chorus is, is the gospel in a nutshell. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away.
just a brief word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're beginning uh, a new series today, an uh, eight-part series on the life of the Apostle Paul. And we're exploring his missionary journeys and also his journey to Rome, and we'll be thinking about those in weeks. Today, Paul chosen, changed, and commissioned. Can a leopard change his spots? Cynics would reply, highly unlikely. But thankfully, there are exceptions to the rule. And the Apostle Paul is a prime example of someone totally transformed and utterly changed. Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, was a man whose life unfolded against the backdrop of the Roman Empire's grandeur and the burgeoning Christian movement. The news this week has shown discoveries in Pompeii of how elaborate the decorations were, the, the mosaic flooring, the wonderful paintings on the wall. That was the, the um, Roman Empire. Born as Saul, he would become one of the most influential people in the history of Christianity. His biography is not just a historical account, but a compelling narrative of transformation. As we begin this series, we delve deep into the life of Paul, such a remarkable individual. Tracing his early years, the dramatic turning point on the road to Damascus, and the profound impact of his conversion. Saul, who was later to be known as Paul, was born in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia, a province in the southeastern part of the Roman Empire, now part of Turkey. His exact birth remains elusive. Historians estimate it to be around 5 to 10 AD, several years after the birth of Jesus. It was, uh, Tarsus was known for its rich culture, its trade and intellectual activity. It was here that Paul spent his formative years. Saul's family background, certainly in the account in Philippians, is likely Jewish, and he was born into the tribe of Benjamin, one of the most important of the tribes. Saul's parents named him after the first king of Israel. And it's essential to understand this Jewish heritage as it was to play a central role in shaping his identity and religious upbringing. Judaism played a pivotal role in his early life. He was brought up in the Jewish faith, steeped in its traditions, customs and the religious laws of the time. He would have learnt the Hebrew scriptures, especially the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And that would later serve as the foundation upon which his Christian beliefs were built. As Saul grew, his education was not limited to the religious aspects of Judaism. Tarsus was known for its educational institutions, and it is believed that Saul received a well-rounded education. Notably, he was taught Greek, a language that would be invaluable to him in later life as a, as a missionary as it was widely spoken in the Roman Empire. A significant turning point in Saul's education and religious training occurred when he was sent to Jerusalem. 
This city was the center of Jewish life and the religious scholarship. It offered him access to some of the most esteemed teachers of the Jewish law. Saul became a student of Gamaliel, a highly respected Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Under Gamaliel's tutorage, Saul delved deep into the intricacies of Jewish law and tradition. He became a Pharisee himself, a sect within Judaism, was known for their strict adherence to the law. Saul's Pharisee training left an indelible mark on his life, shaping his religious fervor, meticulously legalistic mindset, and unwavering dedication to God. Saul's early adulthood was marked by a fervent commitment to Judaism and a zealous defense of the faith as he understood it. And as a Pharisee, he considered Christianity to be a threat to Jewish tradition. He saw it as a heretical movement and that, that led him to actively persecute the Christian communities. One of the most infamous incidents during this period was Saul's involvement in the martyrdom of Stephen. Uh, Stephen was one of the first Christian deacons known for his powerful preaching. And the book of Acts records Saul's presence there at Stephen's trial and subsequent stoning. Although Paul didn't actually throw the stones, he held the garments of those who were. He had, and, but the way that um, uh, Samuel, uh, sorry, Stephen, the way that S Stephen died had a profound effect on Paul. His persecution of Christians extended beyond Jerusalem. He sought to eradicate this emerging uh, movement and his reputation as a, a persecutor spread far and wide. And we will see that the arrester is himself arrested, literally in his tracks. It was on the road to Damascus that his life took a dramatic and transformative turn. The story is recounted in Acts 9, in the passage that we heard read this morning. As Saul and his companions approached Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven surrounded them. And Saul fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul responded, Who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go in the city to the city and you'll be told what you must do. Saul, now blinded, was led by his companions into Damascus, where he remained for three days without sight and without eating or drinking. And during that time, a Christian named Ananias received a vision from the Lord, instructed him to go to Saul and lay hands on him. Ananias was hesitant at first, who wouldn't be when faced with someone with such a dangerous reputation, but he obeyed the divine command. And when Ananias placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you were coming here and has sent me that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see once more and he was baptized. The transformation was not limited to his physical sight but to his whole being. There was a complete turn round, a profound conversion, a shift from the zealous persecutor of Christians to a fervent belief in Jesus Christ. Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus was pivotal 
It was a pivotal moment that altered the course of his life. And he went from being a Pharisee who persecuted Christians to an apostle ardently preaching the gospel. Following his conversion, Saul didn't immediately emerge as a renowned figure that we know him to be. But he spent his time in Damascus receiving instruction and growing in the faith. The book of Galatians suggests that he went into Arabia for something like three years because he had to relearn everything. All his previous understanding had been totally um, upside, uh, turned upside down. One can imagine there was so much that Paul needed to rethink, to assimilate his newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's initial interactions with the Christian community were met with skepticism and fear. They were fearful that it was just a trap to um, catch them out and then to uh, put them to death. But however, it was Barnabas, the great encourager, a respecter of the Christian community, who introduced Saul to the apostles and vouched for his transformation. Paul's new life was not without its challenges. He found opposition from those who were still skeptical about his conversion. There were those who were out to murder him as well. Paul eventually had to flee Damascus in a basket and he travelled to Jerusalem and with the help of Barnabas he was persuade, the believers were persuaded that he had in fact changed. And from a zealous persecution of Christians to an unwavering proclaimer of the gospel. Paul experienced two transformations in his life. One was his conversion when his heart was totally transformed. And he described this as putting off the old man and putting on the new. But the second transformation was a much longer process, the process of sanctification, of being made holy. That didn't happen overnight. That was something that was gradual. And he daily took up his cross to follow Jesus, accepting the suffering that was involved in being a follower and disciple of Jesus. I've heard it said that someone had a badge on that said, please be patient with me. God hasn't finished with me yet. And that's very true, and that was certainly true of Paul as well. That although there was that immediate transformation, there was also a gradual transformation of holiness. God was able to give him powerful revelations and his faithful obedience to live the life that God revealed to him uh, led him to become completely transformed. And God used his letters to speak to other people, to teach them the way of godliness to generations to come. And at the end of his life, Paul was able to say, I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. To all who have loved his appearing, he received the end of his faith, the salvation of his soul. Undoubtedly, Paul is one of the most important figures in the Western world, especially for the church, as we'll see in future weeks. He travelled tens of thousands of miles around the Mediterranean, spreading the word of Jesus. He had a unique passport, not only being a Jewish person and a Pharisee, but also a Roman citizen. And we owe some of the earliest documents to the Apostle Paul. In fact, 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by Paul. His life is remarkable, and there is little doubt that it changed the course of history. 
And he strenuously fought for his conviction that um, the gospel was for all people, not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles too, for everyone who would respond. And Paul the theologian was the first to work through many intriguing questions that Jesus' life and death and resurrection had thrown up. And Paul the letter writer not only gives us the profound pieces of early Christian theological reflection, but some of the finest poignant writing in history. Uh, and in fact, we, we have his letters, many of them preceded the Gospels. Paul's conversion was uh, to be around 36 AD and his martyrdom in Rome about 67 AD. And his conversion day is often celebrated on the 25th of January at the end of the week of prayer for Christian unity. We learn three things particularly from Paul's conversion. One, that God can save the antagonistic, even the most antagonistic, to the faith. We understand that Paul was a fervent persecutor and was on his way to another location in his crackdown against the followers of the way. But the Lord had another plan for him, even though he had been antagonistic to the believers originally. Now he was totally different. And that, that can be true of anyone who is willing to come to the faith. Is there anyone that we deem unsavable? God is able to save all those who draw near to him. The late broadcaster Malcolm Muggeridge was antagonistic towards the Christian faith. He was determined to disprove the existence of Christ and set out to establish his unbelief once and for all. But as he examined the evidence, he found that the case for Christ was overwhelming. So much so that he ended up writing a book entitled, Jesus Rediscovered. He was now a convinced believer. Miracles can happen, and how amazing to see such a transformation, that even the most unlikely people can be transformed by Christ. And secondly, our salvation makes us realise how blind we were before Christ saved us. Saul literally went blind afterwards, but his eyes were opened and his life was totally changed. And Job, of course, he said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, he said to God, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself in dust and ashes. When we get, get a glimpse of Jesus as he is, we recognise our smallness compared to his greatness, that our lives are transformed. I see it all now, that he has died for me, that he has transformed me. We realise how blind we were when God opens our eyes and we see his glory. And thirdly, we are saved from something for something. In Acts 9 verses 1 to 6, uh, we heard read that Paul was saved. He was a chosen instrument to go on God's behalf. God had other plans. He stopped him going down that path of persecution. God did the same for us when he turned us in our tracks towards himself. And he can do for those who have never known that experience for themselves. Through his son's atoning sacrifice, God has saved us from our sins. We discover that Paul was humbled after meeting Christ and through the courage and obedience of Ananias his sight was restored. God didn't just save him from something but he saved him for something 
to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he has saved us from our sins, from Satan and hell, saved us for holiness, for himself, and the works that he has prepared for us to do in advance. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of God. We may feel totally unworthy, as indeed we are, but every one of us, the message of Paul is that we can be transformed, that we can be made use, use, renewed people, that we can be of service to him. I conclude by reading a poem. It's really based on the prodigal son, but it's so appropriate. I have fallen, Lord. The son said, I have fallen, Father. I have left your work undone. The father said, it's so, but the work has begun. Trust me for new strength, then pray and carry on. The son said, what's the use, Lord? It's always been the same. I'll serve you for a little while and then fail you once again. The father smiled. I'll take that risk because I've work to do and that work will be incomplete unless I'm joined by you. The son said, but you see my life as in a single scene. How can you love me, Father, after all that I've been? And he said, I can see no past. A cross has come between. There is a new beginning for every one of us. Paul assures us by his own life that that is so. And by God's grace, he doesn't wash his hands of us, but he said, I've got work for you to do. You're precious to me. You are my child. Thanks be to God. Amen. We sing our final hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found.
Please do stay after the service. Tea and coffee will be served here in the church. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to be to him in the church, in Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with each one of us and all whom we love, today and always. Amen. <laughs>